Okay, good morning everyone. I think we should get started. So um, yeah, welcome back to MIS. Today's topic will be privacy and security. Um, first of all, uh, again, some organizational things. Um, I apologize for not getting the YouTube lecture up yet on the context topic. I actually recorded part of it during my conference tip, trip, but the audio quality was so bad, I'll have to redo it because it's nearly unusable. So it might take a few more days until I get that ready. But the topics aren't that uh, connected anymore, so we're looking at individual topics now, so I think it's not too bad. Um, in terms of the uh, project, I already wrote this on the uh, message board. So uh, until tomorrow, I'd like for each team to have so, uh, some paper preferences, which one you would like to look into. We also won't take the full 90 minutes today for the lecture, I think. So we will have some time afterwards to, if you have any, any questions about any specific papers, we can discuss them afterwards. Um, then on Friday, there uh, is the tutorial time slot at uh, half, half past one. And there, in that time slot, we will just have individual meetings with every team for five to 10 minutes. And we we'll, can briefly discuss how you can, can approach your, your project. And we will give, give you some suggestions as how to start. And then uh, next week, we will continue with the regular lectures. And then uh, in two weeks, we will have again a, a basic Q&A tutorial where you can come with individual questions about your projects. OK, but now let's look into um, privacy and security. We already talked about this briefly as one of the issues we will, uh, we will have to deal with uh, with respect to mobile devices. We have lots of important information on our mobile devices, information that is valuable to us, but that's also um, valuable to others. So we have, uh, of course, for example, your contact information, and that's interesting to a company like Facebook because it wants, or, or Google, who wants to do some kind of data mining uh, with respect to how people know each other. And uh, you may have stuff on there like uh, access codes for your, uh, for your bank account. And that's, of course, of interest to, to uh, criminals who want to clear, clear out your bank account. Um, and of course, we also have uh, stuff like secret services who also somehow want to, to access the data to supposedly find criminals or do something else, nobody knows. So to summarize, a lot of people want to access the data in your, on your phone, regardless of whether you want that or not. And I think there are uh, four, four major problems which, which we have to address here. So first problem is we don't actually have um, a proper, proper encryption usually, usually on mobiles. And there's two different aspects of encryption we have to look at. One is uh, so-called device encryption. That is, is the data which is actually stored locally on your mobile device, is that data encrypted somehow? Um, so the idea here is that the data on the flash memory is encrypted with some kind of key, and that key somehow has to be derived from information that you provide, you as the user. That's very important. We'll, we'll look into that later in more detail. Um, but if the, uh, the key, the encryption key isn't derived from somehow from data you provide, then it's of course very easy to uh, re regenerate the key from the same data. Um, if this device encryption isn't in place, then it's usually very easy to actually access the data as soon as you have physical access to the device. Then you can basically just make a copy of the entire memory and then you have all the data that's on the device. Um, the other aspect is looking at data in transit, so data that's transmitted from your mobile device to somewhere else. Is that encrypted or not? And um, often enough it's not encrypted, which is also not good because then it can be intercepted. We already looked at um, mobile providers, for example, how data is routed through mobile providers and they basically have access to all your data packets. They're not supposed to look, look at those packets, but they still can and nobody can really, really stop them if they want to. So the only way to stop them is to actually 
encrypt the data right on the mobile device and only de decrypt it again at the, at the other end of the communications channel. Um, next problem uh, is yeah, basically cloud services. So everybody uses them in some way, but um, of course there are the, the issues I already, already mentioned that um, many of those companies somehow want to, uh, want to access your data, want to somehow data mine it to, to extract valuable information. And, um, but we still use them for a variety of reasons. One of the reasons is um, that we actually want to yeah, substitute resources. So for example, we don't want to store all of our data locally because we don't have that much storage on our mobile device. So we make a trade-off and store it in a cloud service. Then we have to, of course, pay for that with, uh, on the one hand with uh, bandwidth because we always have to transfer the data, but we also kind of pay for it with our um, personal information, which is then accessible to the um, to the cloud service. Um, well, we, often enough, even if we just uh, think we trust one cloud service, we actually implicitly trust several of them because you don't know what the cloud service actually is doing behind the scenes. Maybe it's in fact using something like Amazon Compute Cloud uh, or something like that. So the, the data, the cloud service in itself is actually outsourcing uh, your data to a secondary cloud service, which of course has again its own uh, terms of service and uh, also has access to all of your data and so on. So that's also, also an issue. Um, and if you don't have this kind of end-to-end -end encryption, I already, already mentioned, where really only the communicating endpoints um, um, have the encryption key, then the cloud provider is basically free to do whatever they want with your data. Um, that, of course, doesn't really work if you um, want the cloud provider to actually process your data in some way. If you only want to store it there, then this is still possible. Then you can just decrypt it on your mobile device, for example. If the cloud provider is supposed to do some kind of processing on your images, for example, then that doesn't work, of course. Then you have to trust them. Um, additional issue, which is kind of related, is that uh, the, the legal framework for data projection, uh, protection is uh, not, not quite hasn't quite yet arrived in the digital age. So for example, in the European Union, you have, I don't know, 28 member states and 28 different uh, laws for how to protect data. So uh, same with the US, uh, sometimes it differs by state. Uh, in general, it's much more relaxed in the US and most cloud services are situated in the US. So which, which legal framework does actually apply? So this, these are all questions which um, don't really have a proper answer yet. There are some, some um, attempts to create a unified legal framework, but uh, you, it, it's, I think it's safe to assume that if you create a unified framework, then it will be the most relaxed one that's, that's uh, kind of a lowest common denominator for all of them. So the user will probably not be the, the main beneficiary in this case. So um, also, what's also a problem, rather now not in terms of legal framework, but in terms of software framework, is that uh, the, the access control provided by the device itself is often not very uh, fine-grained. In many cases, you can just approve something as a whole. So with Android, it was the case that you could just approve all, um, all permissions for, uh, for a sp certain app as a whole or not at all. And if you didn't approve them at all, then the app wouldn't be installed. So you couldn't actually use it at, at all. By now, it's that's changed a little, so you can now uh, allow individual uh, uh, permissions, but you still can't, for example, give an app only access to one contact. So if you want to, uh, for example, don't want it to know your whole address book, that's still, so if you give it, still give it access to the address book, then it has access to all of it. Uh, and that's 
maybe not what you want, but you don't have a, really don't have a choice in that case. And for that reason, if you have apps that are either malicious or just nosy and try to collect as much data as possible, that's still very easy for them. Um, and the uh, fourth facet of, of the problem we're dealing with is that mobile devices are often very intransparent. So um, that means it's not really possible for you as a user, even if you're a computer scientist, even then it's not really possible to independently verify all the components that are uh, running on your mobile device. So uh, we already talked about the baseband module, which does the communication with, uh, with uh, cell towers, for example, that has its own CPU, its own RAM, its own operating system. It's completely independent from the mobile operating system. And there are known cases where um, you can basically uh, attack the mobile device via the base baseband module because there are some bugs in the baseband module, which actually very rarely gets updated. Even if your uh, phone gets an operating system update, that doesn't mean that the baseband module will get run. So the bugs in there are actually uh, often unfixed for years. And if someone finds a way to exploit one of these bugs, then your phone is basically open to the world. Um, then for, even, even if you discount the baseband module, the operating system on your device is still not very transparent. For iOS, for example, you don't have, really have a way to look into there at all. Same for Windows Phone. Android is supposedly open source, but there's a, a, still some parts are not. So for example, all of the apps by Google, Google Maps, Play Store, and so on, they're not open source, so you don't know what they actually do. Um, some people try to analyze them, of course, but that's not really uh, something which everybody can do. And also they get updated all the time, so you would have to redo that uh, over and over again. And there are uh, a lot of uh, drivers for Android devices which are not open source. Um, and some vendors also make modifications that are not open source. So in, in total, even if you have an Android device, then you can maybe verify half of the code that's actually running on your device or even less. Um, and the entire rest is still completely intransparent and it may contain bugs, it may contain security issues, it might even contain backdoors, intentional backdoors, nobody knows. That's also part of, of the problems. <coughs> 